Good morning. We are gathered here in front of the State House on a devastating but utterly predictable day. This has been part of the GOP's playbook and strategy for decades. But here we are. And today, they are striking at women's right. A woman's right to make the most private and intimate of decisions. It will not only affect her reproductive rights, her access to health care, it will affect every single part of her life, from housing to food instability, to jobs and careers, to the ability to raise a family and have a family who sees opportunity in our country and in, a, in our economy. And they will not be satisfied with rolling back the clock on women. They will come for LGBTQ communities, communities of color, for immigrant communities. They will come because they have told us they will. This is not hyperbole. This is not paranoia. Look at the votes of the GOP in state houses and Congress and the U.S. Senate. They have a strategy and it is to take away the economic security from women, middle and lower income families and communities of color. But we are not powerless in the face of this frustrating, devastating wrong. We, for now, have the right to vote and we must execute on that. Our answer to this attack on our constitutional rights, on the fundamentals of our democracy, is to flex our electoral muscle, to support in our local races in November, from school board to city council to selectmen to, to our mayors, to support the champions we have behind us who will keep Massachusetts safe. This does not happen by accident. It happens when we mobilize, when we organize, when we recognize that we are striving for a more perfect union. And then that vision includes everyone, everyone. That the liberties that we talk about are not just adages, that we are moving and using our vote to make sure that equality and justice for all is not just a saying, it is actuality and reality. But today we are faced with the reality that women are going to be forced into pregnancy. That women who have been victims of rape, incest, whose pregnancy may, may determine whether they live or die, will not have that right to make a decision. And that ripple effect is going to affect all of our civil rights and the gains that we have made. So this November, in these races, everything is on the line. Our democracy is on the line. And if you don't feel affected by this draft opinion, you will soon. It is out there, it is public, what the GOP agenda is for our country. And it is not one where we see ourselves and our neighbors and our children and our planet that has a future. So that's why today is the day we galvanize. We can despair and then we organize. We pull our strength, the strength of community, the strength of leading with a democracy. This is what this country is built on. The dreams that everyone can see themselves in our future, that is what is being threatened by this decision. And it starts with leaders like Senate President Karen Spilka, who knows and is committed to being a champion for women because when you're fighting for women, you're fighting for the success of every single American family. And that is why we need her voice returned to the State House and why I'm so proud to announce her as our next speaker. Thank you, Congresswoman Clark. Can we hear another round of applause for those great words and motivation? Thank you, thank you. 
Let me start by saying Massachusetts State Senate stands with women and girls who identify as women and girls throughout America that a woman's right to choose is a woman's right to choose, period. No conditions, no ifs, ands, and buts, but it is a right to choose. I'm proud to say that in order to save lives and preserve the rights of women, girls, and those who identify as women and girls, the Massachusetts Senate has taken steps to uphold reproductive rights here in Massachusetts. Yes, that is a good thing. We need to do more, but we've done some already. In 2018, the Senate passed the Nasty Women Act, which removed outdated and unconstitutional bans on all abortions, on abortions after the 12th week, and on unmarried couples using contraception. Isn't that pretty amazing that that even existed, that we had to do that? In 2020, in response to what was happening on a national level, I am proud to remind po people that we pushed for timely action in defense of women's reproductive rights right here in Massachusetts. And the Senate, the legislature passed the Roe Act which formally incorporates and enshrines the concept of Roe v. Wade into Massachusetts state law. We, we were worried something like this would happen. And I want to also say that I woke up this morning very dejected, outraged, angry. I believe this is one of the saddest days in the United States history. It is very sad to me knowing that my children, future generations may have, and uh, if this goes to be, less rights than I had, less rights than you have, and that in future generations that there could be an attack on so many other people that we need to take action and take action now. I do want to remind people that we, the legislature, overrode the governor's veto of the Roe Act. We stood up. We did it twice. This fight right here in Massachusetts, we have fought the fight with our partners, with all of you behind us. But the fight is not over. And the fight is not just in Massachusetts right now. It's bigger than Massachusetts. We must state loud and clear, be very loud, so that the entire country, the entire world can hear us. That a woman's ability to control her reproductive future is fun fundamental to her freedom, to her agency, and to her humanity. It's not just a state level that we have to take action. It is incumbent upon each and every one of you as well. We must use our individual voices. We must use our individual resources. We must use our individual organizing power to fight back at those at the federal level or other state legislatures across the country who seek to roll back abortion rights. This is the emergency we all feared. But this is America. This is a clarion call for us to take action. In America, we all have a voice. We will not be silent. We will not go quietly. We will not go into a devastating future that seeks to treat us as second-class citizens. 
As a young woman in the 70s, I honestly took for granted that I would have access to abortion care and reproductive care if needed, and that I want that to be true for the future generations as well. So in Massachusetts, I pledge to you, we will continue to lead the way. We have a history here of leading the way, and we will continue, and we will continue to fight. And now it is my great honor and privilege to introduce to you a dear friend and partner in government here and in Massachusetts, what all that we do. I would like for you to put your hands together and give a warm wel welcome to Mayor Michelle Wu. Thank you to all the organizations who have gathered and brought us together today for your advocacy for many, many years. Thank you to our Congresswoman and our entire federal delegation fighting for us every single day in the face of what we see here. Thank you to the Speaker and Senate President for hosting us outside this important treasure in our public building. It's a cold day in Boston and around the country. It's a cold May day. This morning I bundled up my boys as they headed off for school, wrapped them in their winter coats, and I suited up for battle, for the fight that we are all in, the fight for their future, and the fight for the future that all of our communities deserve. When I first saw the news last night, I felt the way I imagine millions of us around the country felt. A breaking news alert telling you that the decision about when and whether to become a parent might not any longer be yours to make. This isn't a final decision, but it is one that we've been expecting. With a right-wing court about to strip away basic protections that so many fought for. A fringe minority determined to drag us back into the dangers of decades past, into the shameful shadows of policies that our grandparents feared. Abortion care is health care. Reproductive justice is gender justice, is queer justice, is justice. It has been a fight to get here and it will take a fight to keep going. In Justice Alito's leaked draft, he writes, we do not pretend to know how our political system or society will respond to today's decision. What he should have written is, we do not pretend to care. <laughs> we know how society will be impacted. Reproductive freedom touches each and every one of us it is a majority consensus of this country. And we've seen from decades of data, from the, our loved ones' real lives, that laws restricting reproductive rights aren't effective in reducing the number of abortions. They only make them less safe. This is a far-right court majority that doesn't pretend to care, that doesn't see us, doesn't want to hear us, but we are here. How society will, will respond is up to us. And here in the Commonwealth, here in Boston, we are ready. I am so grateful to legislative leaders who partnered with community activists to deliver the strongest protections in the country in Massachusetts Roe Act passed last session. Embedding life-saving protections into law, making us the first state to legislatively remove unnecessary complicating consent requirements for young people to access compassionate care. Those of us advocating then, those legislators leading the charge, those advocates and activists and community organizations knew what was at stake. And that is why we are ready for this moment. 
this fight for our lives. I do want to remind us that Boston has been here before. Our city is no stranger to fighting for our freedom. We're proud of our many historic firsts. First public parks, public schools, libraries, first in the country to give birth to our democracy, abolition, suffrage, marriage equality, climate justice. These firsts have been established with the greater good in mind, with the belief that freedom to access knowledge, nature, recreation, education, health, would make us a stronger, smarter, fairer society, would invest in our shared future, in our common wealth. At our best, we have always been a beacon for the rest of the country. And that is our responsibility today, now more than ever. On my part, on behalf of the city of Boston, we are committed to keeping that legacy alive, to working with partners at the state level, at the federal level, to do everything it takes and it will take everything to defend reproductive justice for all. We are all better off when a young person in our communities can access the health care they need without fear that they'll end up on the street or in jail. We are all more connected when a pregnant survivor of assault has options and support that make them feel less alone. We are all healthier when everyone in our communities is healthy. Two months ago at City Hall when we announced Boston's new office of LGBTQ plus advancement, I said that progress is often a fight but also sometimes a dance. But today is a fight. We are here. We are ready. We will not back down. And uh, it is my honor. I think I got flipped in the in the speaking order. This is this is the people's house, and uh, proud to defer to our legislative leaders. So I get the chance to introduce friend, leader, someone who has been helping shepherd through these changes at the state level, alongside the Senate President, Speaker Ron Mariano. Thank you, Mayor. Um, it is a dull, cold day here this morning. And as I uh, turned on my TV this morning and, and got the news and listened to some of the commentators on the news stations, it struck me what a significant change this will be in the history of our country. And we heard some very impassioned reasons from the folks who are actively involved in the daily fight to preserve these rights. These rights that every woman, every woman in Massachusetts and in this country deserves to have. We don't want to raise the first generation who has less freedoms than their mothers. It is a significant issue that we were aware of a few years back as we watched the Republican playbook muscle in control of the Supreme Court with raw political power, with Mitch McConnell holding up confirmations and then advancing confirmations that agreed with his political philosophy. That is how we got here today. And if you think it is ending here today, you're sadly mistaken. As I listen to these impassioned pleas, and trust me, they're all meaningful. But we in the political business recognized the potential for this problem a few years ago. That's why we began to codify the Roe Act in the Massachusetts laws. The fact of the matter is we need to fight back. We need to elect people who understand what this freedom means to every woman in the country. You know, 
you have to do is watch the news for a bit and you see some Republican governor standing up wanting to take a personal right, whether it's a voting right away, whereas an LBGTQ right away. Every one of them are committed to destroying the rights of our citizens, particularly women, poor people, black or brown people. It is a consistent game plan. And for one, I think I've had it. I think that we should be very concerned when the one institution in our democracy that has been above political politics for the 250 years that this country existed is now another political entity. That is where the problem is, folks. That's what we have to fight. We have to take back the control of the Senate and the House. When I mean control, I don't mean a one-vote margin that any disagree, uh, disagreeable individual can stall progress. We need to have a working margin. That's what we should be doing. That's where the fight is. We need to get involved in races. We took the precautions here in Massachusetts. Working with the Senate, we will continue to look at ways to make Massachusetts a beacon for all folks who need this help. But we're not going to do it if we lose control of the House and the Senate, because they're coming, folks. They're coming after gay marriage. They're coming after all the, all the rights that we fought so hard to install in our laws. Pretty soon. The only laws that will matter will be for white old guys like me. Everything else will be gone. If you don't believe that that is the goal, I think you better start paying attention. Because they are blatantly saying that. And I vow to continue in my position as Speaker of the House to work with the Senate President to talk to the advocates to support what we can do to show the, the, the country how to combat this craziness, this, this attack on basic human rights. So I don't know who I'm supposed to introduce next. So I, let me. I think it's me. Okay, Rebecca. <laughs> <laughs> you you take it. Get it's me out of here. Yeah. <laughs> it's a tough act to follow. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. My name is Rebecca Hart Holder. I'm the executive director of Reproductive Equity Now. I wanted I wanted to take a minute to to remember October 2018 when we watched in horror the confirmation hearings of now Justice Brett Kavanaugh. And our organization and the ACLU and Planned Parenthood of Massachusetts went to Senate President Spilka. We went to now Speaker Mariano and we said, something is coming. They are going to take down Roe. And that is what is happening. This institution acted to protect the people of Massachusetts and we cannot forget that. Last night was a harbinger of what's to come, an opinion by the United States Supreme Court that could set our nation back decades, strip us of our bodily autonomy, and steal the right to make the most intimate and private decisions about whether or not to become a parent. The leaked opinion will overturn 50 years of judicial precedent and dismantle the federal constitutional right to abortion. It was a shock to the system, but I want to be very, very clear, it was not a surprise, and we knew it on that day in October 2018. I want to make very clear, 
This is not a final decision yet. It is an unprecedented, it is a shocking leak of a draft opinion. Nothing about federal abortion rights has changed today, and it will not change until there is a decision announced by the High Court in Dobbs v. Jackson. If you have an appointment for abortion care today, your appointment is on. That is very important. This is a confusing time. Abortion care is still legal. But it does confirm that we have absolutely no time to waste. And thankfully in Massachusetts, abortion will remain legal no matter the decision of the final court and in spite of Charlie Baker's two vetoes. But access is not guaranteed anywhere in this country. When the Dobbs decision comes down, the U.S. is poised to see 26 states overnight ban abortion care. This will be a devastating, unprecedented health care crisis. Pregnant people, especially poor people, black and brown people, LGBTQ people, will face extraordinary barriers to care. They will be forced to travel hundreds or thousands of miles. And for too many, the cost is going to be simply too great. Have no doubt Massachusetts is not immune to the cascading impact of this decision. Providers in Massachusetts are already seeing patients from Texas where abortion has been banned at six weeks. And people in New Hampshire we know are already coming here to Massachusetts for care. That's why we fought so hard for inclusion of $500,000. that one more time. We are stunned, but we are resolved, regardless of the outcome of Dobbs v. Jackson. And I understand that U.S. Attorney Rachel Rollins is here. Attorney, <laughs> it's my pleasure to introduce U.S. Attorney Rachel Rollins. Thank you so much. Carol Rose will be with you. I will. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Rachel Rollins. Uh, I'm the United States Attorney for the District of Massachusetts. I want to thank the mayor. Um, this is in the wrong order, so let me start. Apologies. The Senate president and the speaker, the mayor. Uh, I want to thank the legislators that are here, city councilors, our exceptional advocates uh, that are arguing. My only role here today, I'm not going to speculate until we have an actual opinion by the United States Supreme Court, but is to tell you what the Department of Justice has done regarding abortion issues. Um, not what they promised to do, but what they have actually done to date regarding abortion. On September 9th, 2021, U.S. Attorney Merrick Garland issued a press release announcing that the Department of Justice had filed a lawsuit to prevent the state of Texas from enforcing Senate Bill 8, which essentially banned abortion at approximately six weeks in nearly all cases. So no exceptions for pregnancies that result from rape, sexual abuse, incest, or for pregnancies involving a fetal defect incompatible with life after birth. So our Attorney General has already sued Texas back in September of 2021. The FBI, which reports up through the Department of Justice, has made clear that any abortion-related extremism, which is an act of domestic terrorism, will be met with investigations and prosecutions. So the FACE Act, the Freedom of Access to Clinical Entrances Act, is in effect and will be enforced by the FBI and federal agencies as well as the U.S. Attorney's Office. And then last but not least, in the case that we are here today about Dobbs v. Jackson, the United States Solicitor General, which is the fourth highest person in our United States Department of Justice, 
argued on December 1st of 2021. That is a public document. You can see all of the arguments made by our Department of Justice. But I think it is really important that we understand not only on the local level what our mayors are going to do, on the state level what our leadership is going to do. And Congresswoman, apologies, I did not, I know there was a Congresswoman here, so I apologize. But at the federal level, um, what people are going to do there. And this is a civics lesson, lesson for people that are no longer taught civics. The legislative branch makes laws, the executive branch carries out laws, and the judicial branch evaluates those laws. And when we are lockstep together, I believe we can make sure that there's equality for all. So it's my pleasure now to introduce you to a person who I believe needs no introduction in Massachusetts. She is an advocate for the Constitution, no matter who you are and what you stand for, what you believe in. She is a fierce advocate for you and for what is right, Carol Rose. Thank you, Rachel Rollins. Um, and thank you all for being here. I'm Carol Rose, Executive Director at the ACLU of Massachusetts. Um, I want to first just say thank you uh, to Congresswoman Clark, uh, to Senate President Spilka, to House Speaker Mariano, uh, to Mayor Wu, uh, to all of the advocates and legislators who've made sure, who've been working on these issues for so long and are making sure that today is not a surprise and we are ready here in Massachusetts. Now this is just a draft opinion. Roe is still the law of the land for now, but it gives us a glimpse of what's coming down the road. And while we were sort of anticipating that another shoe would drop on this, we didn't anticipate that Justice Alito would take a shoe and throw it into the face of women and men throughout this country and take away these rights. And if you look at that draft decision and what it actually says, they're not gonna stop they didn't talk about states' rights. They talked about elected officials, federal elected officials, taking away reproductive justice, taking away reproductive autonomy for people in this country, across the country, including here in Massachusetts. They talked about not just taking away the precedent of Roe, they, the way they framed the argument, and again, it's just a draft, but they're going to be coming for contraception rights next. And then they're going to be coming for LGBTQ and equal marriage next. And then they're going to be coming for all of us next. So we should not sit back. And while we've made great progress here in Massachusetts, thanks to the amazing leadership of the people before us today and others, let's be clear. We cannot rest on our laurels. We cannot play defense. We have to go on the offense at the federal level with people like Rachel Rollins. We have to go on the offense at the state level with the state leadership here. We have to go on the offense at the local school board level and the cities and towns. Mayor Wu talked about the fact that Massachusetts has been a first in so many ways, and she's absolutely right. That's our tradition. We're a beacon of liberty. We're also the first ACLU affiliate in the country. And I will tell you, the ACLU has offices in all 50 states now. And Massachusetts is leading the way, but we will be in all 50 states, in the courts, on the streets, online, in the legislatures, and in Congress to fight back against this pernicious decision by the draft decision by Justice Alito and to make sure that all civil rights and civil liberties are protected. Together we can do it and together we will. Thank you very much and it's my honor. Thank you. It's my honor now to introduce my friend, my sister and my fellow advocate, Dr. Jen Childs Roshock of Planned Parenthood League of Massachusetts. Thanks so much, Carol. Thank you so much um, to all of our leadership here from the federal, uh, the state and the local level. Thank you so much for everything that you continue to do for everyone in the city and the Commonwealth and around the country. So my name is Dr. Jennifer Charles Roshak. I'm the president of Planned Parenthood League of Massachusetts. And I do want to start off by just echoing what others have said. Abortion is still legal here in Massachusetts and across the country, and Planned Parenthood's doors are open to care for patients, both here in Massachusetts and anywhere patients need to be seen today. And that's today and any day in the future. We knew that this decision was coming. We knew that this day would come. This is a draft decision, but it is in fact a, gl a glimpse into our future, and we knew this was coming. And this is what we know. What I know is that there is immense power in the state and local leadership 
to protect this fundamental right to abortion and expand access to abortion and health care. We have proven that right here in Massachusetts, and the proof is here. And we will continue to lead here in Massachusetts, in our health centers, care to all who need it, all who want it, and by legislating reproductive health equity in every corner of this Commonwealth. The impact of losing abortion cannot be overstated. Losing the fundamental ability to control your own health care decisions and plan your family can be catastrophic emotionally, physically, and financially. Restricting abortion access does not change people's decision about seeking abortion care. It just makes it unsafe. Or they force people to continue pregnancies that they do not want and are not ready for and maybe har even harmful. The right to access abortion is protected here in Massachusetts by state law and the state constitution. Another vital component of the post rural landscape is accessible birth control and comprehensive sex education so that people can control their bodies and futures in areas with limited or non-existent abortion access. Contraception, sex education, and abortion are all crucial parts of reproductive freedom and health care. But dealing with the reality of these areas in other parts of the country or even parts of our state with their limited or non-existent access Contraception and sex education is critical. About half of people who have an abortion report having used birth control in the month that they got pregnant because contraception is fallible. Even universal contraception access can't make up for abortion bans. So given this national political climate, Massachusetts has a responsibility to keep leading and keep increasing leadership in protecting access to abortion. At Planned Parenthood, we believe that every individual's decision about a pregnancy should be respected and valued. And we work hard to make sure that patients can make their own personal medical decisions without shame, judgment, or stigma. We believe that patients are the experts in their lives. We trust them to know that their life best, that their unique circumstances and their needs, and we trust them to make their own decisions. So if those who oppose our mission were serious about reducing the rate of abortion in our country, they would work with Planned Parenthood to ensure that people have access to birth control and sex education and every, effect, every effective method of contraception. So thank you so much for being here. I think there may be some time for Q and A, but I'm not sure. I think I'm. I think I'm the last one. I'd like to ask the Well, we're ahead of every other state in that we we did codify Roe versus Wade and even expanded. In, in two particular places, the the coverage. And we did fund in our last budget, which we just finished, and now the Senate will get money to aid in in funding abortions in, in 500, I think it's 500,000. Yeah. 500,000 dollars, which is a significant amount of money. Uh, and that's going over to the Senate, and I'm sure I won't commit the Senator to, to anything, but it could be the same or it could be more. Uh, I'd be very shocked if it was less. So, uh, but, but I do think that we are positioned well. We will work with the folks who are in the field that, that deal with this day to day and see where the ramifications are in, in this new decision and how it affects the demand and where we can be helpful to Planned Parenthood or to any other organization, we will, we will be helpful. Well, that's a, that, that's, it's a little premature to get into yeah. trying to decide yeah. what this Supreme Court is going to do, except that I do know they're not done. So.
Right. It, it's my understanding that we uh, enshrined it in statute as well in our last bill in the Row Act. Yes. So that is a very, very strong statement that reproductive rights will remain here in Massachusetts, that will be a woman's right to choose. Uh, and uh, in addition, uh, we will be looking and meeting with, with folks here and elsewhere to see what else can we do to support women and families in Massachusetts and possibly, you know, other states who might need assistance. Where can Massachusetts continue to be a leader in this area? Madam President, uh, on that note, uh, Connecticut in recent days passed a law that would shield providers in Connecticut and patients from lawsuits from other states because, you know, some amount of states seek an uh, abortion there. Is that a protection you're interested in reporting? Uh, I, I would like to look at everything and see what is out there and what might be best for the, at least the Senate. I don't want to speak on behalf of the House either, but you know, uh, we will have discussions as to what we could do in response to this action, because I believe we keep saying it's only a draft, but it's a matter of time before it becomes a, a real uh, opinion. Um, and I think we need to, do need to mobilize both statutorily, it's up to the states to take action right now. Uh, Congress certainly can take some action. I know it sometimes is hard on their behalf, but they need to take a look at what they can do to help women and families uh, across the country. Uh, and we will continue to do it here in Massachusetts. Madam President, can you give us a preview of the budget and what people funding would be allocating towards abortion access and maybe additional funding to all of the The budget is near to be coming out. It will be coming out, I believe, next week. Um, at that point, uh, it'll be for all the states. Would it be in line with the speakers with that? Uh, I, I think you'll see it. Could you repeat the question, please? Are you concerned that there's going to be a chilling effect for doctors and providers in the state despite the potential to grow up? There probably will be to some extent, but I'm hoping over time they'll realize that uh, in Massachusetts, the right to abortion, the right to choose is protected. Last question. question you, um, Rebecca or Jen, uh, what are organizations uh, making preparations for people from other states to come if this yeah, I'm happy to take that. Uh, at Planned Parenthood, we have seen patients from other states already. Um, we are getting incoming calls from other states, from patients who are living in these deep red states. Um, we've taken care of patients from Texas in particular in both our Springfield and Boston offices. Um, we're ready, we're willing. Um, uh, also, you know, trying to find ways to navigate patients not only to the care that they need, um, but also the funding um, that it takes to get from wherever they are to a state like Massachusetts. But we're ready. Speaking about other states, can you talk to us about New Hampshire, what's going on there, if you're seeing patients from there, what efforts you might be doing in New Hampshire? Um, yeah. Whatever one of you. Yeah. 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 yeah um, I, I, we're not a provider, so I don't, I don't want to speak for Planned Parenthood. But look, look we know that the, anti, the anti-choice legislators in uh, New Hampshire have successfully passed laws. We're worried about it. We're watching it. We know there are patients from New Hampshire coming here for care. And we're very much keeping an eye on it. Last question. Thank you, guys. <laughs> you look very beautiful. <laughs> Yeah. You because it sounds like it's not going to snow.